My name is Jeffrey Blankford. Um, I'm curious, how many of you were here last year? Okay, I may repeat a couple of things, but try not to. One thing that I mentioned last year that I want to make a correction to begin with. I, I, I said it was a mistake to call the Israel lobby a lobby, and I said it was more of a hotel. <laughs> but actually, that doesn't really do it. I, to call a lobby is like calling a mouse a cat. What it is, in fact, is an alternative or competitive government. And the head of those gov that government, the prime minister and the president, will be coming here to, to Washington tomorrow to visit those who support his government. That will also include, unfortunately, two-thirds of the people in Israel's most important occupied territory, which is Congress. And the role of AIPAC is to control that occupied territory, because without that occupied territory, there would be no occupied West Bank. There would, there would be no siege of Gaza. Actually, if the, if, if the people who supported the Palestinian movement, the aggression, had brought up the issue of the USS Liberty, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't have to be here as well. Unfortunately, there's an alienation on the part of many people on the American left from their fellow Americans, so the, the murder of 34 U.S. sailors and the wounding of 171 by Israel is never part of the general discussion. And I'm very glad that Allison brought it up tonight. Uh, tomorrow at that, um, the meeting of the alternative government, uh, our president, Barack Obama, will be paying homage to them again. Uh, so will uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader. He, I mean, these are the speakers. Nancy Pelosi, my former congresswoman, who who probably has pledged her allegiance to Israel as much as any Democrat has ever done. Um, Senator Carl Levin and Senator Joseph Lieberman, who uh, perhaps may be the sleaziest, slimiest person who ever sat in the U.S. Senate. He, came, he, he has been pr presented as epitome of rectitude. People don't realize probably that he was elected to the Senate back in the early 80s when Senator Lowell Weicker, a, a liberal Republican from Connecticut, the liberal Republicans are now extinct, had gone to Cuba and met with Fidel Castro and came back and suggested that the United States and Cuba reconcile and uh, Lieberman ran on a ticket of saying that Wade Weicker is more loyal to uh, Castro than he is to Ronald Reagan. Now, the thing about is important about APAC and U.S. support for Israel is not just the amount of money we give in, for, for them to buy weapons, but it is the political support that the United States gives at every international forum, just not only the U.S. government, but the AFL-CIO, which is a cornerstone of the Israel lobby, probably one of the original cornerstones of the Israel lobby, and which prevents Israel from being sanctioned in the international forum. Uh, back in 1989, Nehemiah Strassler, writing in Haaretz, wrote, Israel's dependence on the U.S. is far greater than suggested by the sum of three billion. Israel's physical existence depends on the Americans in both military and political terms. Without the U.S., we would not be equipped with the latest fighter planes and all other advanced weapons. Without the American veto, we would long ago have been expelled from every international organization, not to speak of the UN, which would have imposed sanctions on us that would have totally paralyzed Israel's international trade since we cannot exist without, exporting raw, without importing uh, raw material, with ex exported raw materials. So this is something that most people don't realize. That, and yet, ironically, we have never, never had a campaign to stop USA to Israel. Amazing, isn't that? We had a campaign in the 80s when there was, the issue was $15 million to the Contras. And a national mobilization started to call our members of Congress and stop $15 million going to the Contras. At that time, Israel was getting $15 million a day. 
And we won that. Congress did not vote for the 15 million, and they had the Iran Contra scandal because of that. But think about it. Think about why there has never been a campaign to educate the US public about aid to Israel. Instead, what we have heard is end the occupation. End the occupation. It's no longer occupation, it's dispossession. Imagine walking along the street and asking the average American who has no vested interest in Israel or Palestine, what do you mean, when I say end the occupation, what do you mean? And they would give a blank look on their face. Because most Americans do not care about what happens in Israel and Palestine. They do care about their tax dollars go, and that has not been an issue. Think about why not. It's interesting, um, getting back to the issue of government, alternative or competitive government. APAC provides a very important role, but APAC alone would have no power if it was not part of a group of organizations, foundations and think tanks, some of which have already been mentioned, that in, in a sense shape the opinions of the American public and keep Congress in line as well. For example, tomorrow you turn on the television and you'll see Martin Indyk. You could say that almost every Saturday. Tomorrow you'll see Martin Indyk. Maybe you'll see Kenneth Pollack. Maybe you'll see Daniel Pipes. Um, maybe you'll see um, Ken, uh, uh, Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal, uh, who's everywhere, uh, the editor of the Weekly Standard. And he was also one of the founders of the Project for a New American Century. How many of you have heard of that? Now that was started in 1997. And even though Catherine Christensen had mentioned it in a book in 2000, Perceptions of Palestine, it was not until the Scottish, Scottish Sunday Herald in Glasgow published an expose of PNAC that the American movement heard about it. Noam Chomsky never mentioned it, so you didn't hear about it. Um, PNAC is gone, but it, it, it came back into um, uh, another incarnation, two incarnations, but officially, or kind of quasi-officially, was the Foreign Policy Initiative. Anyone ever hear of the Foreign Policy Initiative? Raise your hand. Very good. This was uh, started by William Crystal, and in 2009, um, Michael, by Michael Goldfarb, who was one of its the PNAC people, um, he made an announcement. He was, um, it, it was March 30, 2009. He said, he was the editor of the Weekly Standard, which is a neocon organ. He went on Twitter and claimed, quote, PNAC equals mission accomplished. New mission begins tomorrow morning with the launch of FPI, Foreign Policy Initiative, which they are jokingly called PNAC 2.0. That organization combined with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. How many of you have heard of that? That's sad because this organization started a few days after 9-11. There was a Jewish organization called Emmet, which filed for papers but didn't do anything. And suddenly, two days after 9-11, we have the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, whose um, advisory board, whose um, board of directors, is like a who's who of the American government. Uh, but there you have uh, Bill Crystal, Joe Lieberman, Eric Cantor, Charles Krauthammer, Richard Pearl, and then it was James Woolsey, a former CIA people person, a ch chief who was on almost every pro-Israel foundation. Uh, at Richard Carlson, who was the head of Voice of America, Radio Marti, and the head of the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. Uh, Steve Forbes, uh, Louis Free, who was a former head of the uh, FBI. Max Campbellman, who was a former ambassador and started GINSA. Um, you have Gary Bauer, president of American Values. 
Uh, Red Stevens, who writes for the column for the Wall Street Journal. Michael Ledeen, how many have heard of Michael Ledeen? Okay, <laughs> and, uh, but the point is, they put out a weekly report. And in it, they have major stories from all over the world, but well, actually not all over the world, all the ones that refer to the Middle East and Israel. And in the bottom of their weekly report, they list the number of articles and interviews that fellows from the Foundation of Defense of Democracy have had in the mainstream media. They control the media. Anyone who says the Zionist, into it, whatever it is, do not control and dominate the media, uh, is, is, doesn't know what they're talking about. It wasn't always so. It wasn't always so. Uh, back in the 80s, I may have mentioned last year, uh, in 83, they were so worried about the coverage, the negative coverage of Israel after the invasion of Lebanon, which was, unfortunately, People forget how bloody it was. 18, 20,000 people were killed by the Israelis before Sabra and Shatila. Not by Christian phalanges, but by Israeli bombs, uh, napalm, white phosphorus, and so on. And so they had a meeting in Jerusalem in 83. The main objective uh, of this Hezbara conference was to devise a strategy for, quote, selling post-Lebanon Israel to the US media. Certain basic concepts needed to be emphasized. Israel's strategic importance to the United States, Israel's affinity with Western cultural values. You see shared values, you hear that all the time? Uh, we know what those are, ethnic cleansing and genocide. Huh? Uh, Israel's physical vulnerability, and most importantly, the contention that Israel, unlike the Arabs, fervently desired peace. Now this is 1983, but this was reported in Mother Jones they wouldn't write this today. Mother Jones in 1987, selling Israel to America, the Hasbara Project targets the U.S. media by the late, unfortunately, lamented Robert Friedman. So this is, it was an amazing document. What action was taken on it by our solidarity movement? Thanks to the internet, we have great possibilities. Back in 1987, I made a flyer that said, if it's linked to aid for Israel, Pelosi says she will vote for the Contras. And this is a flyer I made in 1987 with my little Macintosh, and I put up around San Francisco, and it was a committee to rein in on the Democratic Party, or the Dem to rein in and rein on the Democrats Party. If you agree with this flyer, you're a member. And this, these flyers stayed up all around the city. People didn't cover them up. Unfortunately, people said to me, Pelosi's so good on every other issue. And I said, will you say that about someone who supported apartheid in South Africa? Silence. A few years ago, I made this one. Representative Nancy Pelosi, foreign agent. This is a speech that she made at APAC with a lot of bold face wherever she pledged her loyalty. Now, you, you all can do that. But now we have social media. What I suggest you do is go to your website and Google your member of Congress and put in Israel, and you'll find the quotations that a member of Congress has said pledging his or her loyalty to Israel. You will not find that on their website, because they do not want the rest of their voters, their constituents, to know how much they love Israel. If they did, if, the, if their constituents loved Israel as much as they, they love Israel, it would be on their website, but it's not. Pelosi never sent anything to her regular mailers, her regular voters, talking about Israel. It was just to the, certain the Jewish voters. Make a flyer of his or her pro-Israel quote and post anywhere and send it to key media. Go to events where the, where the politicians are scheduled to speak, particularly during the elections, and distribute the quotes. Uh, use Facebook for social networking, get a lot of people to go with you. Go to the politicians' office, not in Washington, but in their local office and demand, don't ask for a meeting, demand a meeting, show the quotes and tell them you're going to go public with this, you want to see the member of Congress. Uh, and list the local Occupy movement if, if there is one. And also, if there are veterans movements or have veterans in your area, bring up the issue of USS Liberty. I've done that as well and found out that they are very receptive. Um, I'm going to finish now because my time is up and we'll all take questions, so thank you very much.